by now that chapter 16 is over, the last of what are actually called the judges. Samson was the last one. So starting with Othniel, going down through Ehud, we had Barak, we had Gideon, we had Jephthah and Samson. Those are the six major judges. And then you had your minor judges, uh, Shamgar and the others. And then you had one guy in the middle who is often called the anti-judge. That's Abimelech. Abimelech was not one of God's judges that he raised up. He was the illegitimate son of Gideon who made an awful lot of trouble. So there are 13 figures that are discussed in total, one of whom doesn't quite fit, which is kind of how the Bible will symbolically talk about things sometimes. That it's 12 tribes of Israel, but there's 13 guys, and that 13th guy really makes an awful lot of trouble. Or if you want to look at it, uh, you have seven major figures that are discussed, and then you have uh, six minor ones. So there's various ways of organizing it, but we've, we've already talked about the main characters of this book. The last two stories, one of which covers chapters 17 and 18, but the other which covers chapters 19 through 21, are sometimes called uh, the epilogues of the book of Judges because they don't, they don't follow the same uh, narrative cycle. You know how they would say, and then they sinned, and then they called out to the Lord, and then God raised up a judge. That, that's not following that. These are just two stories that, for all we know, could take place at the end of this time period, or at least they are representative stories of the kinds of things that were going on in Israel during this time. They are to highlight the depths of, the pra of depravity that existed in Israel prior to the monarchy. Men like Samuel, who was not king, but who anointed King Saul and then King David. And we're going to see, starting in chapter 17 to the end, this phrase repeated several times. And I'm just going to read the last verse of the book, which summarizes the whole point, where it says, In those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So as we look through these last two stories, they're not pleasant stories. This one is not so bad compared to next week. But they are to be representative of the fact that Israel was not serving the Lord. God had done all that he could through the judges. There's one more he's going to raise it up, and that's Samuel. And there could have been others that weren't listed in the story here. But the, the short version is that this is a failure. Just like Joshua said at the beginning or the end of his book, he said, I don't believe you will serve the Lord. And God is going to raise up a king, and that's going to be what we discuss when we get into Ruth and then 1 Samuel. But tonight we're going to look at the story of Micah and his idol, his silver idol. This is not the same Micah of the book of Micah. This is a different one, and uh, you don't want to be like this one, I'll say that. And as we go through this story here about a very prominent example of idolatry being introduced into the land of Israel, you can see in this story a false mirror of the exodus and the wilderness wanderings and the conquest played out in a bad way. And I think some of these points are, are stronger than others. I think some of them are very obvious from the text, and there are others that uh, I certainly was able to draw out, and I, I think it makes the point in any case that, that as they replace the Lord from their lives with these other idols, they keep on trying to live out the plan that God has for them, but they're not going to get the results that they expected in serving the Lord. And there are going to be things that are told them in the name of the Lord that have nothing to do with the Lord. Just as in our lives, when we replace God with somebody else or something else, and yet still expect to have the same kind of blessing and assurance and joy that we have in Christ, we're not going to have it. This is why medication commercials, if I can use the illustration, always have a line in there that says, use as directed. Because if you're going to say, well, I tried it, but you weren't doing it right, then you shouldn't expect the results that are promised to you. So let's look at this story. Chapter 17 and 18 tonight, verses 1 through 3. The title is Deceptive Assurance. There was a man in the hill country of Ephraim whose name was Micah. And he said to his mother, the 1,100 pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears, Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. And his mother said, Blessed be my son by the Lord. And he restored the 1,100 pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, I dedicate the silver to the Lord from my hand for my son to make a carved image and a metal image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. 
We'll stop right there. We have the focus again put upon the tribe of Ephraim. Remember, the tribe of Ephraim was the largest tribe in Israel. It was half of the tribe of Joseph, but they were more blessed than Manasseh was. So they were the lead tribe and would continue to be for a long time. But the book is going to highlight their failure as leaders. We've already seen this several times. Well, you've got this guy named Micah returning some stolen silver to his mother. He says, Mom, you know that silver that you were, you were cursing about? This wasn't just her ranting and raving. It's likely that she had realized the silver had been stolen and said something to the effect of, May God strike down to the earth whoever stole this silver from me. And so he says, hey, mom, uh, you know that silver? That, that was me. And she goes, blessed be my son by the Lord. What a good boy that you, would, that you would give this back when you realize that you might be cursed. You ever known moms like that? Where like even when the kid does wrong, they're doing the right thing? Well, that's what's happening here. And so they say, let's celebrate. And how shall we ce celebrate? Well, I asked God to bring the money back, and he did because you stole it, and then now you brought it back. Let's honor God by building an idol. Let's take some of that money, melt it down, and create a graven image and also a carved image. There would have been a pair. What's better than one idol? Why not two idols, she thinks. So this, this story is rather odd, isn't it? You're supposed to be struck by the, the irreligion in this story. She seems very religious. She loses her money, and she starts speaking in God's name, speaking curses over people, and then her son comes back, and now she's speaking blessings over her son, and, hey, let's do something religious, and we're going to make an idol in the name of the Lord. It's a very almost laughable kind of story that we're going to celebrate, and blessed be the name of the Lord for my thieving son who felt really bad and brought it back. Let's make an idol. We're going to see seven connections I can draw out to the Exodus story here. And the first one we see, the first stage of the Exodus was a demonstration of God's power when he delivered them from the land of Egypt. And that's what we have here. We have a false deliverance from God. She's proclaiming glory to the Lord and blessings over her son like God just did something miraculous. When in reality, her rascally, thieving son... Her superstitious son, who was afraid that he was going to get cursed because mama proclaimed a curse, brings it back. She's acting more like a witch doctor than she is a woman of God. But they're going to act and celebrate like God had done something for them. His name, Micah, is a shortened version of the name Mikayahu, which means, who is like the Lord? If only he had listened to that name. There's this false deliverance that is going to lead them into a, what they see as a religious and worshipful response to something that God had not even done. Many people build their lives on so-called encounters with God where God is not active at all. They bring God into their messed up situation and say the way this worked out is because God made it happen and we're going to build the rest of our life on this story. Now, this can be a wide range of things. This can range from, Lord, I know I told you I was going to stop drinking, but there's the liquor store. Just If the light turns green, then I'll know you want me to go over there. And you want, oh, and lo and behold, blessed be the name of the Lord, it turned green and off we go. Now, you think that's silly, but I'm telling you, I've been doing this a while. I've heard a lot of things. Well, I wondered just where was I supposed to go next? And I saw this cloud extending like the hand of God. I, Let's go that way. And. Can God move like that? Sure. Does he usually? Uh, no, he does not. But you can extend it all the way out to cultists, men like Joseph Smith in upstate New York who claimed to have had a vision of an angel. For all we know, he very well may have, but it was no angel of the Lord that told him that the gospel has been all corrupted. Every church has it wrong, and I'm going to give you a new book that is going to fix all the problems. Well, don't you believe in angels? Don't you believe that God can speak to people? And uh, Yes, I do. I also seem to recall the last time God spoke to somebody, he said, don't add anything to this book. What a weak view of God that believes his book can just be corrupted beyond measure to where he needs a new one. But it's the same principle, isn't it? Oh, God was in this. No, he wasn't. There are many people now where you want to ask them why they engage in a certain behavior or why they believe a certain thing. And rather than defend it, 
whether logically or spiritually or anything, let me tell you my story. Let me tell you my story about why I am this way. As if that's going to excuse it. Now, some people just don't know better. However, there are other people who know good and well they don't have a leg to stand on on the things they've been doing, so they're going to try to make you feel bad for them so that you won't criticize them anymore. But true deliverance from God leaves men speechless and humbled before the Lord. How many people, here's a, here's a Bible study for you to do, how many people pass out in the presence of God in your Bible? I don't know the answer. Go find out. And go let me know, because it's a lot. It's more than a few. People who are made aware of their sin when they're delivered by God. They're aware of God's greatness, how much bigger he is than us. And yet, they're also liberated by his grace and enamored with his person. Anytime somebody legitimately encounters God, they don't walk away saying things like, let's build an idol. Let's write a New Testament of Jesus Christ. They say, who is like the Lord our God? I'll give you an example from Mark chapter 5. Remember the man who had the legion of demons? He was so many demons in him, they they called it the legion, which was thousands of soldiers. Well, as Jesus was getting in the boat to leave in Mark chapter 5, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. Don't leave me. But Jesus did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. That's a real encounter with the Lord. You're not led into further sin. You're delivered out of sin. You have a burning passion to be with Jesus Christ. But even if Jesus were to send you away, you would go away gladly out of gratitude for what the Lord has done for you. When you truly are delivered by the Lord, you lay yourself at his feet. You don't look for a way to dig your hole deeper. And I would say, while many of us have had moments with the Lord that we look back on and say, that was was a significant time in my life. Really, the only encounter of this kind, the only deliverance of this kind any of us needs is what took place at Calvary all those years ago. Jesus died on the cross for you. He rose from the dead for you. He sent his Holy Spirit to seek you out and draw you to himself. But many times we feel like that's not enough and we've got to have something else. But if you try to look for some religious thing to build your life on rather than the truth that's been revealed to you, you're not going to experience the truth of what God can provide. So much of what we're going to talk about tonight is letting go of the imitation and grabbing hold of what's real. Stop chasing the fake halfway thing that might give you the same feeling, but it's never going to give you the same depth. We build on foundations of sand. We drag God into it, but it's deceptive. So let's look at verses 4 through 6. So when he restored the money to his mother, his mother took 200 pieces of silver and gave it to the silversmith who made it into a carved image and a metal image. And it was in the house of Micah. And the man Micah had a shrine, and he made an ephod, which was the garment a priest would wear, and household gods, and ordained one of his sons who became his priest. In those days... There was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So they commissioned some idols to be built. They build a shrine. They ordain a priest. They construct an ephod. They put together household gods, which were those smaller deities that you would worship. Very often they were more like good luck charms. They could be family heirlooms. Sometimes I read today there were even relics of ancestors. There would be skulls or finger bones or those kinds of things that had the spirit of your ancestors in them, as well as the large carved and metal images here. And he essentially begins a small, his own small business here. And my son's a thief and a cheat. He's got to go into business for himself. Why doesn't he start his own oracle business? He'll be right on the side of the road. Anybody traveling by that wants to find out what God thinks about something, they'll come in and see all his idols. He'll have a priest there. He'll be real religious, and he'll make some good money off of that. And supposedly, all of this was done to the Lord. You see that back in uh, verse what is it? Verse 3 said, I'm dedicating this to the Lord. Most idolatry in the Old Testament was done in the name of Jehovah God. So was the golden calf, if you recall. But even though this was done for God, how many laws were they breaking about making graven images? About you shall not ordain just anybody to the priesthood. 
but it has to be somebody from the line of Aaron. How about sacrifices that could only be offered at the place God would choose for himself? And you can imagine somebody reading this and saying, well, why didn't the king stop them? In those days, there was no king in Israel. Everybody just did what was right in his own eyes. Second thing that happened in the story of the Exodus is that the Hebrews met the Lord at Mount Sinai and he descended upon the mountain in fire and smoke and he spoke out of the trumpet blast to them and they saw and beheld the living God and were terrified. And what we have here is a false revelation of God through these idols. Just as at the golden calf, when Aaron made the golden calf and said, Behold your God, O Israel, revealing and unveiling the God to them. There's a similar story going on here. It's a false, phony, laughable imitation of what God had actually done when he descended on the mountain in fire. Now, these people were not, they, I think there was a bit of, of scandal and deception going on here, but they also were wildly deceived. They believed if you make a shrine and dedicate a place and build an idol and then call upon your deity of choice, the God will dwell in that place. And in fact, Paul reminds us in 1 Corinthians 10 that that is what happened, that demons would take the place of these so-called gods and deceive and lie to the people. They truly believed that Jehovah God, Yahweh, was going to live in this man's house where there were idols, as if they had never known him at all. But these were Israelites. And yet, how many people carry ideas with them about God that were not revealed to them from the truth of Scripture or from the truth of the experience of the Holy Spirit, but from their culture or their traditions or their family or just some ideas they picked up when they were scrolling through Instagram one time. Some common ones are kind of tedious to recite them, but it's good to remember that, well, God just wants me to be happy. God just, I don't think that God really cares what I do as long as I'm happy, which if you know your Bible even a little bit, <laughs> you know that that is so profoundly wrong. You, you would have had to be aggressively ignorant if you're going to say, I went to church and that's the idea I got about God. Now, in, in passing here, does God want you to be happy? Of course he does. But there is a true path to happiness, joy, as you want to call it. And God cares more about your holiness than he does about your happiness. However, that corresponds with another false view of God that people have, which is that God is a cosmic killjoy and is always mad and angry at you and is always wanting to bring the hammer down on somebody. You get some people that talk about God that, God that way and like it. They like it because it allows them, it gives them permission to unleash you know, their double-barreled shotgun of theology on somebody anytime they want to. They see somebody walking in sin, or maybe not even walking in sin, just doing something they don't like. Don't you know what God has said? And <laughs> off they go. There are some people who think that about God and dislike it. Check the YouTube comments on some of our videos online lately. Always a way to ruin your day, by the way, or make you laugh, depending on your temperament, I guess. But people say, God is the worst. God would send people to hell. How can, you, how can God tell somebody that if you don't do what I say, I'm going to send you to hell? That's so wrong. It's so messed up. And it's like, yeah, you, you do have that all wrong and all messed up. And then some people, they, they don't even really have formed ideas about God. They're just kind of these, these hippy-dippy kind of magical ideas about who the Lord is. You know, the, a common one I see is people that want to merge these, these neo-pagan ideas about manifesting things, right? I'm just going to want it really bad and, and just kind of, you know, do some cosmic push-ups and then things will just come into my life. And then you start hearing Christians talk about prayer that way. Like you're just going to, oh, God has to, because he said when God is a person and prayer is a conversation, it's not a, a chant or a mantra or anything. But it's, it's revelation that people didn't get from the Word or from God. What is God like? God is the self-existent, omnipotent, omnipresent, omniscient, omnibenevolent God. He is a person. In fact, He is three persons in one. You can't even quite wrap your head around that because He's so high above you. He is love and He is justice in perfect union. He is holy in his nature. He's jealous in his relationships. And his ways have been revealed to us in his word. And I, I am often disappointed at myself 
and other believers when we have this great wealth of knowledge about who God is, and yet we can't be bothered to open it up and read it. Ah, I read it once. You read it once. And you feel like you got everything you needed to get out of it? Then summarize the book of Zephaniah for me right quick. Tell me if you were paying attention. Like Zephaniah is not in there yet. It's <laughs> Isaiah chapter 40. The prophet said this. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compare with him? An idol? A craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Like, are, are you crazy? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Isaiah has this constant refrain in his book saying, you know what God is like. How can you compare him to an ox or a fish or a bird or a man or even a king? Because God is so far above you. Haven't we known this since the very beginning? How can you even compare God to anything? That's true biblical revelation. And when that's who your God is, you're not going to be doing silly, petty things like building up your own pop-up shrine for people to come by and, and meet with God real quick on the way if you give me a little money. Not only that, though, if you define God in your own way, you're not truly going to encounter him. But you're going to think you are. And so when you walk away empty, you're going to say things like, well, I tried it and it didn't really work for me. But did you? Did you, though? Did you come into contact with the living God? Because you'll never forget that. Ah, oh, I don't really have time for theology. You must take time for that, to whatever degree you can, because you need to know who it is you're talking about, who it is you're talking to. And also, so that when you do seek the Lord, you're not going to be deceived and left empty and hungry and thirsty from the one that's supposed to satisfy your soul. Well, they set up this phony shrine here, and they're not done. In verse 7... Now, there was a young man of Bethlehem in Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite. Remember, the Levites were scattered throughout the land. They had their own cities. And he sojourned there. And the man departed from the town of Bethlehem in Judah to sojourn where he could find a place. So things don't look so good if the Levites don't have anywhere to go. And as he journeyed, he came to the hill country of Ephraim to the house of Micah. And Micah said to him, where do you come from? He said to him, I'm a Levite of Bethlehem in Judah, and I'm going to sojourn where I may find a place. And Micah said to him, stay with me and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver a year and a suit of clothes and your living. And the Levite went in, and the Levite was content to dwell with the man. And the young man became to him like one of his sons. And Micah ordained the Levite, and the young man became his priest and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, now I know that the Lord will prosper me, because I have a Levite as priest." So he hires a Levite from Bethlehem to be his priest. And he seems to think this is going to please God. Never mind that there were idols here. Never mind that the other priests he had were not Levites. Or that God had condemned even the high priest himself, Aaron, when he created a false idol. Micah is treating religion as the object of his goal, not God himself. If I can put together a great religion, God will be pleased by that, rather than what does God himself desire. The third thing that happened in the story of Israel is they arrived at the Mount Sinai, and God revealed to them the proper mode of worship. And this is the inverse of that. It is false worship, despite his hopes. And you know, the thought that this guy is saying, well, now God will bless me, shows you that he knows better. He knows that you're supposed to have Levites doing this, which means he also probably knew you weren't supposed to have idols, which means he also probably knew he shouldn't have, be having his own shrine in the first place. But he didn't care. Or he cared, but not enough to give up the money he was going to make. He thought that a Levite will excuse my idolatry. 
Trusting in the trappings of religion is the bane of many people who believe themselves to be Christians. Remember, today is all about leaving aside the phony and going after what's real. And there are so many that they chase the religious aspects. And I don't think religion is a bad word, personally. I take the the caution against religion versus relationship very seriously. But I'm using this term positively now. As a system of how we do things, yeah, this is very good. But it becomes a problem when this is what it's all about, as opposed to the Lord himself. People who put more stock in the music of the church than the one to whom we are singing the music in the church. That's an example. And that is not, to to be clear, just an old person thing, as it is often put out. There are an awful lot of young folks that say, I won't go to a church like that. I hate the music. Guess what? Those people are going to grow up and be old people that say, I hate the music. When really, is it about the music or is it about the Lord we're singing to? You should be able to walk into a room with the worst out-of-tune singer, the worst out-of-tune guitar, nobody else is really singing aloud, and sing to God with all your heart. Why? Because who cares about this? We're singing to the Lord. Now, are we supposed to try to play skillfully? Yes, we are. But that is secondary, tertiary, all the way down to the bottom of the list when it compares to singing the praises of God himself. Or maybe the events that the church does. You ever know somebody that lives for the next church potluck? Like that's, that's what their life is, is preparing for the next thing. And I'm in charge of the ice. And if you want to try to get on my turf, then we're going to have a problem, you and me, because I said I wanted the 16-pound bags of ice, not the 12-pound bags of ice. And how dare you try to come in and take this? Have you ever known somebody like that? And that person, in those conversations, invariably it'll go, we're trying to do this for Jesus. It's like, are you trying to do this for Jesus? Because it seems like you're trying to do it for the sake of doing it. Or attendance. Well, I go. And uh, I don't want to hear another word out of you. I go and I go. No, very good for you. That's, that's great that you come. I don't think that's a bad thing. But if you think that is a sufficient thing, you're kind of missing it, aren't you? It's not just about being here. If you don't listen, if you don't pay attention, if you're sitting there thinking about what you're going to do as soon as this is over, and is he getting close? He's usually, eh, say, all right, where are we? How far are we getting? Oh, we have a whole other chapter. But, but I'm here. <laughs> don't you ever say I'm not here. I've known men that are not walking with Jesus, have the foulest mouth and the foulest temper you've ever met, tell the foulest jokes, but the minute their kid says he doesn't want to go to church, how dare you not want to go to church? You're going to church, boy, that's what we're doing. But it makes you wonder why. Because the kid gets it. Well, dad hates going to church, so why should I even care to go? Or people who prioritize their tithe or someone else's tithe. I uh, notice you haven't been giving as you used to. I'm, you said you got a raise this year, yet your giving is down 14%. So what, this, one reason among many why I don't want to know who gives what. So if you ever feel like he really didn't say anything about that big gift that I gave, I don't know about it because I'm not going to treat anybody differently because of the money they give. And some people put in entirely too much stock in the actual rituals themselves. You know, you go over to Nepal, and everybody that's flying on a plane has a tikka on their forehead. They offer rice to their god. They dip it in the, ri- the red paste, and then they put the rice on their forehead with the red paste because the god blessed the food, and now I've got the offering on my forehead, and the plane won't crash. And you say, that's ridiculous. It's just culture. No, nope, they, they take it dead serious. And there are some people that can treat baptism or communion or any of our rituals that we have as a church as being in that category. But I'll tell you, even the splendid symbols of the law were only intended to instruct men about God and direct their attention to his person. The rites and the rituals are not efficacious of themselves. If we learned anything from Jesus, we should have learned that. That it's not about washing your hands properly. The Sabbath is not about you making sure you don't move a muscle or bat an eyelash. It's about serving the Lord. Or what Paul tells us about circumcision in the book of Galatians. Oh yeah, well circumcision, but apply that to any work of the flesh, however noble it might be. Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4, when she was trying to bait him into a debate, and said, where do we worship? Worship on this mountain or this mountain over here? Because, you know, Jacob worshiped here, but you say we got to worship. So which is it? And Jesus said to her, woman... (laughs) Jesus started a lot of sentences like that. Woman, believe me. I could preach that right there. Woman, believe me. 
keep that at a women's retreat or something like that, right? <laughs> Woman, believe Jesus. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. Notice he's not refusing to take a position. But he continues, the hour is coming and is now here when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. God is to be worshipped in spirit and truth. It doesn't matter if you've got a Levite and you're worshipping with idols because you're, you're thinking that it's, well, first of all, you're worshipping with a lie, but secondly, you're not worshipping in spirit. You're thinking that the flesh is going to give you a leg up with God. But God goes, I don't care about that. I want your heart. I want you to worship me in spirit and in truth. The Bible is one long extended story of the God of the universe reaching down to the people he has made to say, I want you to know me. If you put your faith in the church or in Christianity or any other religious thing, you will miss the goal, which is to know God himself. Jesus even said in John 17, this is eternal life. Speaking to the Father, he said that they know you and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Paul said, I gave up everything that I might know Christ. And he even says in that passage, Philippians 3, that's maturity in Christ, is to have left behind the flesh and to care only about the person of Jesus. And yet the unfortunate thing is, many of us experience that when we first get saved, and it's all about Christ, and it's all about knowing him, and I can't believe his grace, but the longer you're in church, you become more attached to the trappings of the ministry rather than the person that were there to worship himself. Let go of the phony or even the insufficient and grab hold of what's real. Chapter 18 now. In those days, there was no king in Israel. And in those days, the tribe of the people of Dan was seeking for itself an inheritance to dwell in. For until then, no inheritance among the tribes of Israel had fallen to them. So the people of Dan sent five able men from the whole number of their tribe, from Zorah and from Eshtol, to spy out the land and to explore it. And they said to them, go and explore the land. And they came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. Now, the tribe of Dan, sending out scouts to find a permanent home, they are going to lodge at the house of Micah. We saw back in chapter 1, you might remember, in verse 34, that the tribe of Dan was unable to conquer the portion of the territory that had been given to them by Joshua. Now, they were forced back up into the hills, and they lived as a, as a nomadic people even still. They had not been able to settle in the valleys, especially the Amorites and the Philistines gave them trouble. Now, Samson was from the tribe of Dan, so we're not quite sure because of the structure of the book where this fits chronologically. It could be that this was after Samson, and that when Samson died, the people realized, look, if Samson can't get us out of this mess, nobody's getting us out. Or this could be separated in time. It's, it's really not important. The point is that they are still wandering, even in the promised land. And the fourth parallel we see here is that Israel had wandered in the wilderness because they had sinned and failed to take possession of the promised land. And that's the same thing that's happening to the tribe of Dan. This is a false journey based on a lack of faith to step up and take what God had given them. I call this a false journey because they should never have been in this position in the first place. They should have trusted God to lead them to victory against the Amorites and the Philistines. That even though their numbers were small and the technology of the Philistines was so strong, if Samson had taught them anything, it should have been that numbers are really not important when it comes to the people of God. But now they're wandering. They're on a journey. They're on a quest. And there are many people who find themselves lost and wandering through life because they have failed to heed God's commandments. And we call it a journey. And I chose that phrasing, false journey, because it doesn't quite fit maybe the, the story so well here, but it does fit what, a, what the point I think it teaches us. That many people, that they will say, well, I'm just on my journey with Jesus. I'm just on, a, on my quest. I'm on my trail. I'm following the path. I'm just going to see where it takes me. I'm just drifting. I'm wandering. I'm just waiting and see when... We hear that and we go, well, if they're on a spiritual journey, that's good. Not necessarily. Not necessarily. There are some people that are wandering long after they should have found the place where they were supposed to be. Maybe you know somebody that's been a seeker of God forever. And it's like, if you were really seeking, you should have found something by now. 
if by failing to heed God's commandments and do what's right. And so I'm trying my best to follow Jesus. I'm doing my best, but you, you just can't get your sex life under control. You're constantly bouncing from one person to the next, to the next, to the next. And then I come back to Jesus. And I say, oh, Lord, I got it all under control now. And then you go right back to it. And that person, oh, I'm just, I'm just still wandering. I'm just waiting to see where God's going to lead me. It's like, no, no, no. You know where God's leading you. You just won't go. You won't go down into the valley and take possession of it. Drugs and alcohol will do the same thing. I've known many wonderful, gifted, godly people, anointed people that will be used to the Lord in amazing ways, yet they just can't put that bottle or that needle or those pills down. And they continually go back to it. And there's all sorts of excuses that can be put out there, but they'll say, I'm just waiting to see what God is trying to do through this. Like, maybe God is not the one that's doing this. Maybe this is you through the inspiration of the devil doing this. Well, nothing happened unless God wants it to happen. That's not true. It's called sin. You think God wants you to step out in sin? Of course not. Is God still sovereign? Yes. I'm not about to get into that whole debate. But we can do that to throw all the responsibility back on God. People that chase money their whole life. Oh, I don't get it. I've been in church my whole life, and now I'm 45. My kids hate me, and my wife's about to leave me, and, and uh, I'm broke, and I don't know what's going on. Well, yeah, because you were going to church, and you had the Jesus you know, fish sticker on your, on your jacket, but you were never following the Lord. You weren't heeding his commandments, and now you find yourself living in the hill country instead of down in the valleys. People that fail to show love. I've known some pastors now that think that they are, there's so much pride in their life that they think, I'm just God's gift to the world, and these people are lucky that I'm here. And they don't show love to them. They don't show compassion or kindness. They don't show extra grace. They're not setting the example of being Christ-like to people. They're angry. They're loud. They're bullying. They're pugnacious. They're brawlers. And then sooner or later, somebody's had enough. Church falls to pieces. Family falls apart. Who knows what happens? Get, find themselves arrested. And they don't understand what's happening. I don't know what this is. What do you mean you don't know? You weren't obeying the Lord. This happens in our marriages. It happens when we're kids and we're rebelling against the Lord. Maybe some of y'all have some moments where you look back and think, man, I, when I was a teenager, I thought I was hot stuff. Rebelling against my parents. Like, I've got to live my own life, Mom. I've got to be my own person and find my own way. And you think, what a stupid thing to do. They had already done it and said, hey, go this way. I said, no, I want to find my own way. And some people never grow out of that, unfortunately. We can admire somebody who endures a long trial but a good brother or sister knows how to look at somebody and say, it's time for you to come out of that trial because this is self-inflicted. It's time for you to be done. In many cases, it is a failure to do what is right, to serve God as he is, or acknowledge his authority that traps people. And sometimes you interact with somebody, you get in the car and you're talking to your husband and you say, she's doing this, 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 this. This is what she needs to do. If she would just get this together, then maybe she would get her act together. Hey, maybe next time don't say that to your husband in the car or to your friends in the text chain. Say it to them. Be a good friend. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. I love you with all my heart, but you need to hear this. Well, they'll be mad at me. Yeah, okay. But I don't know if we're supposed to do that in God's church. We are. Where else are they going to get it? It traps people. Here's an example. This is in the book of Haggai, chapter 1. This is when they were back in the land trying to rebuild the temple, and they're having some financial difficulties. And the prophet explains, he says, you looked for much, and behold, it came to little. You ever uh, have a bonus coming your way, and you're looking for much, and it comes to little? And when you brought it home, I blew it away. You ever feel like that about your paycheck? I just got paid. Where did it all go? You're looking at the, the transactions. I don't remember any of these things. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house that lies in ruins, while the rest of you busies himself with his own house. Therefore, the heavens above you have withheld the dew, and the earth has withheld its produce. And I have called for a drought on the land and the hills, on the grain, the new wine, the oil, on what the ground brings forth on man and beast and all their labors. The Lord says, my temple has not been rebuilt yet, and you're already at the stage where you're, you're putting crown molding in your own house. So you know what? I'm not going to bless your money anymore. I'm not going to do that. There are some times where God says, I'm going to stop blessing your journey because it's time for you to stop journeying and arrive somewhere. 
And if we do that, we can persist and start looking for solutions from other places rather than through obedience to Christ. You're not really following the Lord, so you start looking for somebody else to save you, thinking you've tried Jesus, and that's how Satan gets people. When you see the the young woman, maybe, who's been walking in rebellion against the Lord, and then all of a sudden she comes home and she says, I finally found the thing that's going to fix me. She got into some weird Buddhist thing. It's like, sweetheart, what are you doing? Well, I've tried Jesus. And like, I've been telling you for 10 years you haven't been trying Jesus. And this is going to cause trouble. And so what's going to happen to the Danites? Because they're not doing what God told them to, get, to do. They're going to meet this guy with some idols in his house. And in verse 3, it says, when they were at the house of Micah, they recognized the voice of the young Levite. That could perhaps be mean to be said, the accent of the young Levite. As in, what are you doing up here? And they turned aside and said to him, who brought you here? What are you doing in this place? What is your business here? He said to them, this is how Micah dealt with me. He has hired me and I have become his priest. And they said to him, inquire of God, please, that we may know whether the journey we are setting out will succeed. And the priest said to them, go in peace. The journey on which you go was under the eye of the Lord. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people who were there, how they lived in security after the manner of the Sidonians, quiet and unsuspecting, lacking nothing that is in the earth and possessing wealth. And how they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with anyone. And when they came to their brothers at Zorah and Eshtol, their brothers said to them, what do you report? They said, arise and let us go up against them, for we have seen the land and behold, it is very good. And will you do nothing? Do not be slow to go, to enter in and possess the land. As soon as you go, you will come to an unsuspecting people. The land is spacious, for God has given it into your hands, a place where there is no lack of anything that is in the earth. So 600 men of the tribe of Dan, armed with weapons of war, set out from Zorah and Eshtol and went up and camped at Kiriath-Jairim in Judah. On this account, that place is called Mahanadan, which is the camp of Dan to this day. Behold, it is west of Kiriath-Jairim. And they passed on from there to the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. So the Danites, hey, you're a southern boy. What are you doing all the way up here in Ephraim? I recognize that accent. But they say, hey, what are you doing up here? Says, well, Micah hired me. Micah's made me his priest. And they go, really? Well, then go inquire of the Lord. Go into them idols you got and offer a sacrifice for us and see what the Lord says. The Lord says, go for it. Notice it doesn't say, and the Lord responded and said. He's making stuff up. God's not in that. Well, they go out to Laish, which if you look at the, the map in the back of your Bible, maybe it's all the way up in the north, outside of the normal boundaries of Israel. It is a Sidonian city. Sidon was a sister city to Tyre. The people group were called the Phoenicians, uh, very famous historically. Our alphabet goes back to the Phoenician alphabet, which is pretty exciting. Uh, and Jezebel was from Sidon. So they're not godly people. But notably, this is not part of the territory God had given to the land of Israel. Sidon was not one of the tribes that God told them to conquer. But they picked it because it's a good spot and it's isolated. Nobody's going to hear them scream and we can just stay there and nobody will bother of us. And they, they inquire of the Lord, showing, them, showing us that this is how religion was done in these days. What he did was write in his own eyes. Oh, hey, you, you're a priest? Well, well, tell me. Not questioning the fact Wait, what kind of priest? What kind of priest are you? Ark of the Covenant is in Shiloh. What are you doing here? Don't, by the way, you, you'll meet lots of people that'll tell you, oh, you know, I'm ordained. I got my master's of divinity. I have a doctorate. I have some sort of credential. Question it if you're unsure. And if somebody, somebody that truly loves the Lord is not going to be upset to answer some of those questions. Because I say, oh, I'm a pastor. You're a pastor? Where? I said, Calvert Chapel. I'm not going to go, how dare you question me? I'm the man of God for this hour, friend. Haven't you heard? Well, the... It's okay to be suspicious if it seems suspicious. But that's not the point of this message today. But he gives them the blessing of the Lord. And they come back, and you can see how the language very closely parallels what was said when Joshua and Caleb came back to Kadesh Barnea and told everybody, go up into the land. It is a good land. Israel was assured by Moses that the land was there and this, theirs, and this is false assurance from man, not from God. Who was this Levite to tell them that God was with them in taking possession of a city that was far outside of the boundaries? God had already spoken and told them what their boundaries were. So a, a true man of God would have said to them, I'm not going to inquire of the Lord. God has already told you what is good. 
Maybe you've noticed, you've ever asked me a question about your life or about some moral thing, I'm going to start opening up some Bible verses. I had a kid tell me one time, he says, all you ever do is just read the Bible. I mean, tell me what you think. I'm like, I don't want to tell you what I think. Who cares what I think? What does God say? What does the Word say? But it is not hard to find people who will give you assurance no matter what you're doing. Even religious figures that will give you assurance no matter what you're doing. They just put out affirmations for you to download. They're like fortune cookie, you know, theology. Like What you're doing is good. Just keep after it. Don't let anybody tell you different. Block out the haters. Somebody says they have haters. That's kind of a red flag for me. I'm just going to say that. <laughs> friends will do this to you. Not your good friends. Your good friend will look you in the eye and say, what is wrong with you if you're doing something wrong? Oh, I found this other woman and she's real cute. What do you think I should do? What do you, what do you think I'm going to say you should do? Well, you said you'd support me in everything. Yeah, when you took them vows in that church and I was sitting right there. I'm supporting you in that. Friends will do this to you. Well, friends are supposed to stick by each other no matter what. Yeah, friends who are codependent and want somebody else to stand there behind all of their mess when they do something terrible too. Pastors will do this. Very often pastors that are very needy and need the affirmation of people all the time and don't, can't bear the thought of somebody saying something nasty and leaving the church. Now, I'm not made of stone. When somebody leaves the church, it hurts, and it hurts personally. It's bad. well, hey, I haven't seen you in a while. Well, you know, we just didn't really feel loved there. And it's like, ugh, <laughs> okay, have fun, you know. And you've got to learn to give that over to the Lord. And I've been doing this a while as an assistant and now as a senior pastor, so I've learned to deal with it. But, you know, I understand the temptation to say, what can I do to keep you here? You ever, like, try to quit your wireless company, and then they ask you that question? I always get a little bit of chuckle in my throat when they do that. Like, I've been waiting to quit AT&T for five years, and now I finally get the chance to be somebody else. Uh, let's see. What, well, what can I do to keep you here? What can you do? You should answer that question five years ago, friend. Mr. Verizon or Geico or pick your favorite corporation that you've done business with. That happened when I went to buy a car recently. We're going back and forth forever and ever. You got to bring the price down. No, got to bring the price down. No. They do the thing where they're like, they come back. Let me go take a look. And they bring you back the exact same sheet. Oh, I just changed. This didn't change the price. Well, I, I can't do anything, Mr. Warner. I'm sorry. All right. Well, then we're going to go. We'll talk to you later. What can I do to keep, <laughs> keep your business, man? All that to say, that's not a good friend to you. That's somebody that needs something from you. Now, a salesman does that. Well, that's what they're supposed to do. I'm not, you know, condemning that. But when somebody does that, something spiritual or moral, that's not good. You can always find somebody online to tell you what you want to hear. Well, I found this pastor online. I've never followed by anything good usually. Well, what denomination does he belong to? I don't know, but he's got some great thumbnails and a lot of followers. And he's always, you know, like pointing up at things like this in the videos. And this just seems really great. Some of you all know what I'm talking about. And they have, you know, only have something positive to say. I have lots of positive things to say. But read your Bible. It's not all positive. People that want to outlaw shame. Have you noticed that? You can't do this kind of shaming or that kind of shaming or this. Just let people do whatever they want. And it's really unfortunate that if you look at some of the ways we speak about our own country, we say we want no king and people to be able to do whatever is right in their own eyes. I'm not going to open that box any farther. Just pray about it. we got an election coming up. <laughs> Fact is, sometimes what is needed is a rebuke, not assurance, to turn you back from your folly, not just to speak kindly because that's what Jesus would do. That's a denial of God's truth. Jeremiah 23, Jeremiah and others, Micah, not this Micah, but the other prophet, had to deal with other false prophets that would preach over them when they were trying to give God's word. And the Lord speaks in Jeremiah 23, I did not send the prophets, yet they ran. I did not speak to them, yet they prophesied. But if they had stood in my counsel, then they would have proclaimed my words to my people, and they would have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their deeds. It's the Lord saying, if they were really my prophets, they wouldn't be speaking nice things to the people right now, Jeremiah. You feel like you're all alone. All the other prophets are saying, just, hey, don't worry about it. God's with you. Everything's going to be okay. Hey, shalom, brother. Get out there and do whatever you want. And you feel like you're the crazy one for saying this is wrong. It's not good. He says, hey, I didn't send those prophets. So don't compare yourself to them, Jeremiah, because they're not my men. 
You've been in my councils, and you know exactly how I feel about this. That's why we need the church. That's why we need the church, isn't it? Be around people that every now and then are just going to, you know, give us a pop upside the back of the head spiritually. No. No, you can't do that. Well, I'm just having a hard time. Oh, well, you're having a hard time? You're having a hard time. We'll talk about that. We're not about to talk about this. Because God has already told you, O oh, tribe of Dan, where your land is to be. And you don't get to go look for something else because it got hard. It can give you false assurance that Jesus does not provide. Verse 13, or 14 through 26. And the five men who had gone out to scout the country of Laish said to their brothers, Do you know that in these houses there are an ephod, household gods, a carved image, and a metal image? Now therefore consider what you will do. And they turned aside there and came to the house of the young Levite at the home of Micah and asked him about his welfare. Now the six hundred men of the Danites, armed with their weapons of war, stood by the entrance of the gate. And the five men who had gone to scout out the land went up and entered and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, and the metal image, while the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the six hundred men armed with weapons of war. And when these went into Micah's house and took the carved image, the ephod, the household gods, the metal image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? They said to him, Keep quiet. Put your hand on your mouth and come with us and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be priest to the house of one man or to be priest to a tribe and clan in Israel? And the priest's heart was glad. He took the ephod and the household gods and the carved image and went along with the people. So they turned and departed, putting the little ones and the livestock and the goods in front of them. When they had gone a distance from the home of Micah, the men who were in the houses near Micah's house were called out and they overtook the people of Dan. And they shouted to the people of Dan who turned around and said to Micah, What is the matter with you that you come with such a company? And he said, You take my gods that I made and the priest and go away, and what have I left? How then do you ask me, what is the matter with you? Isn't it a bummer when your gods can be stolen? And the people of Dan said to him, Do not let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall upon you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. I wouldn't speak so loud, Micah. We've got some rough customers around here, and they might not like it so much. Then the people of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his home. The Danites steal his idols, they recruit his Levite, and he can't do a thing about it. They deceived him, then they bribed him, then they intimidated him. They say, we need God's blessing for this endeavor. So they thought they could take it by force. Sixth, just as God went before Israel in the Ark of the Covenant, this is a false presence of God. An idol is nothing. The word idol means shadow or empty because it's just a rock or a stick that you carved or melted. If you can steal God, what is he? This is why God outlawed idols. And God even speaks about idols in such a way that almost demonstrate he doesn't even get it. Like, I don't understand why you bow down to a tree. It's a tree. You chopped it down. And you're going to bow down to it. You burn some of it to cook your supper, and then the rest of you said, oh, save me. Oh, there's just such nobility in those ancient heathen religions. No, it's not. It's patronizing. It's paternalistic. It's kind of racist in many cases. They're too dumb to know better, those poor, yet God doesn't think so. If you can steal God, what is he? We likewise will find substitutes for the presence of the Holy Spirit in our life, something to guide us, something to show us the way and lead us on, forgetting that the Holy Spirit has an opinion on how you live your life. He cares. Oh, God doesn't care about my individual things. Do you think that God's omniscience is so limited that he can't care about the opinions of your life? He has has an opinion. He has something to say. I'm just going to determine for myself where I'm going to go. I am the the captain of my soul, the master of my own fate. Oh, that sounds really great. Yep, and that ship is going to lead you straight to hell, my friend. Or some people just will cling to other folks. Some of the ministry leaders that I train, I tell them to watch out for this. I don't think I've had this happen since I've been down here, so I can speak very freely now. But you will have people that will latch themselves onto you, and they're not so much worshiping Jesus as they are, in a sense, worshiping you. And their spirituality rises and falls with whether you smiled or frowned at them that day. And even if you don't do this on purpose, there are people that they're desperate for somebody to take them by the hand and lead them. And they're susceptible to false teachers. But what a good believer will do is disciple them. Don't look at me. Look at Christ. If you need to use me as an example and a teacher, I'm happy to do that. But I'm not Jesus. 
Paul the apostle would say himself, who is Paul? Who is Peter? Who cares who I am? Some people just would say, well, you know what? Life just happens, man. Just go with the flow. Whatever happens, happens, and that's just the way it is. That is not a biblical way of looking at things. The Bible tells you take responsibility for your life. Get up and make something of it. That's the first thing God said to Adam. Go fill the earth. Multiply. Make something out of this world that I've made. Subdue it. To walk with God is to be intimately connected with Him, to hear His voice and receive His peace. This is why it, it burdens me when people feel the need to call upon saints or to call upon other people or even you know, some other religion to give them what Jesus offers them freely. You have the direct line to God. Why do you need somebody else? You can study it. You can serve to, to follow Him, but that's not going to fill the void. You must have that personal knowledge of the Spirit yourself. You need to know the voice of God. Start by reading His book so you recognize it. You ever hear somebody speak a few times and then you read something they wrote and you go, oh wow, it sounds just like them. I remember when I read Art of the Deal, Donald Trump's book, and I read it and go, oh my goodness, it sounds just like him. I'm just using it as an illustration. Calm down, okay? We, we, know, we know how he's always saying, like, hey, believe me, nobody knows there's a guy. Like, it'd be right there. I'm like, man, it sounds just like him. Or like when my dad asked me to edit some of his papers for school, I'm like, man, he writes like he talks. Guess what? So does the Spirit. You read his book. He's not going to say something different to you. Well, God told me that I don't get to be saved by grace. Really? Would God say that to you? I just feel it so strongly. Forget what you feel. What does it say? And then when you start listening, you can sort through the impressions of your heart until you're actually hearing the voice of God. But the Bible tells us we have to wait upon the Lord. Wow, what does that mean? It just means wait, guys. Why won't God tell me the answer? Wait. I've been waiting for three weeks. Keep waiting. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 through 5, Jesus told them, in the church, he said, while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Friends, if you can be baptized with the Holy Spirit and filled with the Holy Spirit and empowered by the Holy Spirit, why would you settle for something else? If that's possible for you, how can you go home and fret about things and start looking up for somebody else's answers or finding someone to follow or just saying, you know what, I'm just going to figure it out myself when God is right there to speak to you. How easy it is to set our own course, drag God along, and then claim he's leading you. I bet you they said things like, God has led us to this place. And God's like, I'm not even with you, but if that is me, you kidnapped me and you dragged me there. Some of us do that. And we say, God, what would you bring us here for? God's like, I didn't bring you there. You weren't listening to me. You did your own thing, and now you're wondering why you're here. Listen to the Holy Spirit. Verse 27 to the end now. And the people of Dan took what Micah had made, the priest who belonged to him, and they came to Laish, a people quiet and unsuspecting. They come off real good in this story, don't they? And struck them with the edge of the sword and burned the city with fire. And there was no deliverer because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with anyone. It was in the valley that belongs to Beth Rehov. Then they rebuilt the city and lived in it. And they named the city Dan, after the name of Dan their ancestor, who was born to Israel. But the name of the city was Laish at the first. And the people of Dan set up the carved image for themselves. And do you want to know who this Levite was? Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses. And his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set up Micah's carved image that he made as long as the house of God was at Shiloh. The Danites conquered the city way up in the north, renamed it Dan. They established the idols there. And you get the sense that God disapproves of this conquest. Saying, good for you guys. You found a quiet, peaceful, unsuspecting people and you burned their city to the ground. I'm real proud of you. This was not their allotment. And the judgment of the Lord was not on this people. Also, we see that Moses was the ancestor of this Levite. This doesn't mean that he was his direct grandson. It's by calling him a son of Gershom, the son of Moses, it can imply a descendant of Moses. But maybe it was his grandson. Again, we don't know about the time here. This shrine, he says, would be used until the captivity of the people. And the question is, is that the Babylonian captivity, the Assyrian captivity? Could it have been what happened when the Philistines burned Shiloh to the ground? We'll read about that later. 
We do know that when Jeroboam builds the golden calves and sets them up in northern Israel, Dan is one of the cities where he's going to place one of his idols. The seventh thing, seventh parallels, God gave Israel the promised land through the conquest. This is a false conquest by the ones who had failed at the proper one. They were happy to find a home, but they should have taken the one that God had given to them. It would have been better. Many people find some measure of success, but they settle for less than God's will because all along they've been following a silver idol rather than the true and living God. And they get stuck there in our careers. Nations will get stuck here. Parents get stuck in this, this uneasy truce with their kids. They think this is about as good as we can do. Or in our own morality. Because we can't conquer that one area of our life. We look for something else to conquer instead. God has so many wonderful things available to us. But when we ignore His voice, we start adjusting our expectations. We revise them lower to, a, to conform to what we're experiencing. And then we never gain the fullness of what He's promised. 2 Samuel 2 tells us that David had a famine in his land because Saul had put the Gibeonites to death. Remember the Gibeonites, the ones that made that fake treaty with Israel and God said, you're not allowed to touch them ever? Saul couldn't get anything else right in his life, so he's going to be fake spiritual and say, well, let's just kill the Gibeonites because they should never have belonged to, they should have been conquered in the first place anyway. And it ends up causing trouble for Israel later. God's promises are so wonderful. But when you're not walking in his ways and you're not following him personally, you won't experience those promises. So somebody will come along and convince you those promises never meant what you thought they said in the first place. When in reality, you haven't encountered God at all. Israel here is not worshiping God in truth. They're letting their culture and their own whims dictate how they acted towards God. And it led to this, this chaos of religion and false assurance for the people of Dan, as it does for us too. When you replace the truth about God for a lie, it will make you miserable because it does not satisfy. That guy's name was Micah. It means, who is like the Lord? But he thought, well, maybe this idol I can make will be just like the Lord. Maybe if he had learned the lesson of his own name, he would never have been in this position. God and his truth. This is the best part, guys. Because God and his truth is so wonderful and so loving and so good, you don't want to go for the fake and the phony or halfway. Life comes alive. It goes from black and white to color when you begin to serve the Lord. But we say, well, there's so many things I have to give up. Well, it's true. You do need to die to yourself. But you die so that you can live. Just like a caterpillar has to, has to spin that cocoon. Can't be a, p a pleasant experience for him. But so that what can happen? He can climb out. He can be that butterfly. Something totally different, more wonderful, more beautiful. Able to fly and move like never before. But many of us are afraid to go through the transformation. And so we start saying, well, I guess this is all God ever wanted for me. Don't let the devil convince you of that. Chase the real thing. Find out when you seek the Lord what real assurance is all about.